It's really uh, an honor to be recognized by the university. And, uh, you know, I didn't know Wes Graham well. I met him a few times, but uh, I always remember Whatcom was a, a superb example of a startup company that was spun out of Waterloo and set the, the gold bar in certain areas for compiler optimization and uh, SQL performance and uh, cross-platform before anyone thought about cross-platform capabilities. And Ian and I were talking earlier and he was telling us how, you know, Wacom had the uh, Z80 C compilers early on and uh, that was just like a time uh, that I thought was super exciting and I'm, I'm so glad that that tradition is, is continuing on in uh, Wes Graham's name. So um, let me tell you just a, a little bit about myself. Uh, so I graduated from UW in 1984 with a master's degree in math, but really it's computer science. And um, my thesis was under uh, Gord Cormack. Uh, it was on the principles of programming environments, and I was all about uh, programmer productivity and languages and stuff. Uh, my first computer that I owned was an Apple II uh, Plus. It had an uh, awesome amount of memory, 64K, uh, two floppy drives, 140K each. And uh, so this, this is a picture of me from UW, and Andrea Chapel is there on, on the one side. She lived with me, not, I can't say, no, that sounds funny. We were at Minota Hagee together, and then another gentleman, Brian Smith, who was in computer science. And, uh, you know, back then, uh, when we were in Minota Hagee, and there were a few older graduate students who must have been all of like 26 or 27, and we thought, wow, those guys are really old. And now it's 20 <coughs> something years later. It's like, wow, I guess I'm really old now. But I'm gonna try to tell you some things that maybe will be interesting to you if you're, if you're thinking about a, a career in the industry or you're wondering how Silicon Valley works or you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, I spent 25 years in the software industry. And uh, you know, when I was an undergraduate uh, in, in Concordia in Montreal, I was just fascinated by the industry. And I thought this was the coolest thing going on and I was just so grateful to be able to come and study that at UW and continue to uh, operate in that industry. Um, and also I, ha I occasionally run marathons and play very bad guitar. Um, but So there's three parts that I'm going to talk about here. One, I'm going to talk a little bit about how uh, the landscape of computing evolved over some 30 years. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, theory of uh, disruption. And this comes from work by Clayton Christensen, who's quite famous in this area. And then I'm going to talk thirdly about uh, how we actually kind of applied these techniques, we weren't always conscious of them, in uh, developing MySQL and uh, making that into a business. Um, and then uh, if you have questions as we go through, like I'm totally fine if you want to put up your hand or just shout out questions um, and, and so that you can get something out of this, uh, this lecture. Um, so, you know, looking back in hindsight, it's kind of in amazing to see the progress that's happened in the computer industry. And, you know, there's many s cliches about this, that if cars evolved as fast as computers, et cetera. Uh, but it was really brought home when I was thinking back to my first computer, this Apple II. And it had a CPU that ran at one megahertz. And today, you know, if you have a desktop computer, it's running, you know, a couple of gig, two gig, 2.4 gig, something like that, which, again, my degree is, it's technically math, but really it's computer science, which means I actually didn't compute those numbers, so I could be off. Um, but, you know, it's like about 2,000 times faster. Uh, and then if you look at uh, communication speed, you know, back then a, a modem was running 300 baud. And that was like, wow, this is fantastic. I can connect to another computer. And today, you know, you're, you're running at 10,000 times that speed with a, a T1 or a T3. It's, it's, it's even faster off the charts. Uh, memory back then, it was 64K. You know, that's what the Apple II had, which means this graph demonstrating Moore's law with the, these uh, processor speeds and transistors, like you couldn't fit that on a computer, not on a personal computer. You know, that was, uh, you know, 64K was kind of, that was a lot of memory back then. Uh, and then, you know, disk space, you know, from floppies running 140K to, uh, you know, today you can buy a terabyte of storage. What's the terabyte of storage cost? You know, 100, 100 zero? <laughs> okay. Three your pots of Cheerios. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's getting to that rate. So uh, it's just been a fantastic evolution. 
And as you know, we, we take this computing power, we can do some pretty amazing stuff with it, right? So now you get a, an iPhone, and an iPhone has more computing power than the mainframes had at Waterloo when I was a graduate student here. You know, this has 64 gigs of memory on it. So you can do all kinds of fantastic stuff like playing Angry Birds on any platform you have, right? So this is the, the power of computing. Now I'm a software guy, so I look at this processor stuff and it's like, okay, that's cool, but what can we do with it? So I think back as uh, over the 30 years, there's been these evolutions in computing platforms. And uh, you know, the early days, the Apple II uh, back then in the, in the late 70s, the IBM PC, the original Mac, and uh, you know, I bought a Mac in 1985 when I was here as a grad student, and there were about three Macs on campus at the time. And it, you know, again, it had like 512K. You know, I bought an external hard drive that was all of 10 meg in size, so you could store about three MP3 files on it. Not that we had MP3 files. We had like eight track tapes or something crazy. Um, but as, these, as, as the computer industry has evolved, you know, the platforms have grown to take advantage of the processing power. And every time there's a bump in ship speed or connectivity or storage, the operating systems would evolve so you could do more with it. And we've gone through this phenomenal progress of different platforms coming out uh, and evolving. And you know, for many years, Windows was a dominant platform. For you know, 20, 25 years, Windows seemed like it was unstoppable. And you know, the Mac originated a lot of the very cool GUI stuff. Windows sort of took over. Then you have things like uh, Linux, or you could argue today Google is a platform. And what do you do with platforms? Well, you build applications on those things. And to me, that was like, uh, again, a really exciting area. So when I think back to the kinds of applications that uh, you could build, you know, they, they evolved very rapidly as the computing power and the platforms enabled them. So the early applications were, you know, DOS, character-based, VisiCalc, the first spreadsheet ran in 64K, uh, Infocom games, text games, interactive fiction, stuff like that. It was, this was very cool stuff in its time. Um, and I got to work at a company called Borland uh, for, for about, just about nine, 10 years in the languages area, which was just, to me, was super exciting. And, uh, you know, we had a lot, of, uh, a lot of focus on what we called software craftsmanship. And the idea was that we knew that our software was going to be used by hundreds of thousands of people. So we would sweat the details. And we'd sweat the details of stuff that nobody would ever see under the hood. You know, because, but, but we knew that the functionality was important. And that there was an elegance that we wanted to provide to make, not only have a product that does something, but make it work elegantly. Make it so that we were super proud of it. If an extra dialog box has to pop up on top of another one and it's ugly, it's like, just spend the extra time and fix it and do it right so that people would have a, 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 a good experience using the software. There's a bunch of different products that I, I worked on through these years at, at Borland and then MySQL uh, and then a, you know, a company called Zendesk where I'm at now. And basically the idea is that you, know, you can take advantage of what's in the platform and this gives you new opportunities. It also creates a bunch of challenges as you're building software because you have to make big decisions about what platforms to use. So let me talk a, a, about that for a minute. So as the technology evolves and it gives you these uh, opportunities for platforms, um, picking the wrong platform can be pretty devastating. And it's only in hindsight that it's obvious that like, well, Windows and Intel was a dominant platform. But at the time it was like, was the Mac gonna win? Is OS2 from IBM going to win? You know, where should I place my bets? And today you have a similar challenge as you look at, well, should I build an application for Android or for iPhone or for the web? Or, or on top of Google with Chrome, and if I build it with Chrome, how do I get it over to this other platform, et cetera? There's a lot of uh, challenges in that area. Uh, and sometimes there's this uh, virtuous cycle that gets created, which is as platforms become more popular, they attract people like yourselves to build applications and you know, developers build for those platforms, and that in turn makes the platform more popular. 
so you sometimes see this phenomena, you know, this virtuous circle with the install base growing, developers, more applications, et cetera. And for a while, Windows and Intel were this dominant platform. And it seems like, wow, that's, it takes such hold that you think, well, how could we possibly go up against that and compete against that platform today? Or if you look at, you know, maybe the mobile phones and you think, well, man, Apple has it with the iPhone. How could I possibly unseat that? Or if you're looking at, if you can think of Facebook, perhaps as a platform, you say, well, how could we ever unseat Facebook and do something different? And the amazing thing is, because of the power of the technology, you can disrupt these platforms. And there are changes that take place. And the trick is to think about this a little bit differently. So I'm gonna distinguish between two types of innovation. So the graph I showed earlier with the memory and the processors and stuff, is sustained innovation, meaning making something better, faster, cheaper on a continuous cycle, where you effectively do the same thing, but you lower the cost or you improve the capacity, et cetera. Or you go from version one to version two to version three, and you keep making things better. But sometimes you gotta just go in a completely different direction if you want to disrupt the industry. And, and that's what I'm gonna talk about now. So, just when you think like there's a lock on everything, sometimes that becomes the seeds for disruption and massive change in the industry. And this, this comes from some work, so I don't want this to be like a, a big scandal like uh, with the, the recent uh, medical, uh, was it the convocation at the medical class? So this is work that was originated by Clayton Christensen, who's a very good guy. I'm not pretending it's my work. <laughs> um, but the notion is that sometimes a new technology or a new change can disrupt the existing way of doing things. And the irony around this is uh, you often think about how do I make something better, faster, do more. And to disrupt the industry, you actually have to think in an opposite way, which is the disruption doesn't necessarily happen from a better product. It sometimes happens from an inferior product which is kind of bizarre. So let me, let me explain that a little bit further. So, and I have a couple of examples up here of the original uh, Blackberry, uh, the Apple II with Steve Jobs, MySQL or Linux, that these were disruptive changes in the industry. And when they came out, they were all considered worse than the existing solutions or the incumbents. So, uh, you know, there were computers out there you know, uh, when I was here at Waterloo, I mean, there was lots of mainframes and mini computers and deck vaxes and all that stuff. And as the Apple II and the PC and the Mac came out, they were considered dramatically inferior. It's like, well, that's a toy. Why would you want to use that? We've got these high powered computers locked away in mainframes, et cetera, with much more capacity than those original PCs. But what happens is sometimes if you introduce a new technology, it might be inferior based on the established criteria, but it does something new for a broader audience. And this is how disruption occurs. And so the, the, the whole notion is you can be disruptive if you change the game and expand the market. So let me go into a little bit more detail on that. So there's, this is the, you know, I, the lecture of this is kind of uh, named like how to disrupt the software industry in five not so easy pieces. So this is the theory behind these five steps. And it's like, how do you, how do you make disruption happen? And it's again, so, somewhat by looking back over my 25, 30 years, I look back and I see these patterns of disruption. So the first thing is there has to be an existing market. So a proven market where people buy stuff in a certain category. Uh, so you're not necessarily inventing something brand new, but you're inventing a new way to do things. Secondly is there's this notion of an underserved market. People who cannot purchase the thing, the incumbents or the market leaders, maybe because of complexity or maybe because of price, or maybe because it's just inconvenient to get access to. So that's the notion of an underserved market. And you wanna think of the market as a pyramid. This is a broader base here. The third element of disruption, and this is the hardest part, is that when you're a particularly a new company creating something that's disruptive, you want to do, such, do this in a fashion that is inherently unattractive to the big guys. 
So when the Apple II or the Mac came out, the large computer manufacturers who, who built you know, mainframes and mini computers, they look at that stuff and say, well, how the hell can you make money selling a computer at that price? That makes no sense. Nobody's ever gonna buy that stuff, right? That's the notion of disruption. And it, so it has to be unattractive to the larger vendors. And then the key thing is you've got to play by different rules. You don't want to be competing against a, a giant on their turf. You want to figure out the rules that are going to matter to you to make you successful. And then you really have to disrupt everybody. So these opportunities don't come around that often. Uh, but sometimes when you see this, it can shape your thinking. And, and you, you might say, OK, every now and then, if there's an opportunity that's disruptive, you'll have tremendous confidence about going out and doing it. So the implications are, one of the key things is typically big companies are able to operate, uh, or the way big companies operate is they're, they're looking at taking care of their existing customers. And, and, and often they, they serve those existing customers at the exclusion of the broader market. And so what you want to do is if you have a disruptive technology, you want to focus on cases that are below their radar, serving customers that they would find to be unattractive or uninteresting. And then one of the key notions is, because something is new or faster or better, doesn't necessarily make it disruptive. In fact, if it's better, it probably isn't disruptive. This is the hardest thing to get your head around. It's like, you know, the fact that somebody, like when people used to call MySQL a toy, they say, well, that's not a serious database. It doesn't have this capability and this one and this one. So you can't be serious about this. It's like, great. Now we know we're potentially disruptive because we're competing on a different set of criteria. So I'll, I'll just give a couple of examples here, but the way this typically rolls out, and this is uh, you know, from the innovator's dilemma uh, by Clayton Christensen, is um, you know, there's an existing market with incumbents or large companies, and a new entrant, typically a startup, comes out with a new technology that is, when, it, when compared to the old style, it's considered inferior. And then you can start to gain traction in, in this new market. And usually the big guys kind of look at this and they don't quite get it and they don't understand why you're doing it, but they watch and they wait. And over time, if the market expands, then as the disruptor, you can, you're really changing the game and then the market sometimes really starts to boom. And when this happens, it's like just a, the greatest thing that could ever happen. It's like having a hit record at the top of the chart. Suddenly, everybody's moving in your, in your direction. And if you've done it right from a disruptive point of view, the old guys can't really compete on the new criteria that you're establishing. So again, a key, couple implications. Uh, the big guys, the incumbents, are usually very good at sustained innovation. Startups. Small companies can be good at disruptive innovation. And if you work for a company, you want to know which side of that equation you're on. And it's not to say that you, you can't do great things in a big company or do tremendous innovation, but it's probably going to be more of a sustained innovation versus in a startup you can do this disruptive innovation. But if you're in a small company, you got to be very careful if you get into this notion of sustained innovation. Like you know, how can you out, out Facebook Facebook or out Google Google? You might not be able to do that, but you might be able to change the rules. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit. I'm going to talk about uh, my experience uh, when I was at MySQL. How, how many people are familiar with MySQL? Okay, okay, quite a few of you. Did anyone pay for it? Not so much, okay. So MySQL is open source free software. Uh, it's it's a, a kind of an interesting way. And you can disrupt in lots of different ways. You can disrupt by business model, distribution, or technology. This is one of the co-founders of, uh, of MySQL, David Axmark. And the company was founded in, in Sweden and Finland. And this is David in the uh, uh, Stockholm Harbor in a little small boat. And that's Larry Ellison's yacht in the background. And we just thought we had to get a picture of this, because Larry Ellison being the CEO of, of uh, Oracle, being worth uh, uh, $60 billion or something, and we're like, Guess, guess who we're competing against? We're competing against the second richest man in the world. But you know what? We got disruption on our side, so we're not afraid. We're just going to go make it happen. So um, 
you know, I, I kind of have the joke there. Give away the software, and, software for free and make it up in volume. I'm in. And, you know, I joined MySQL in 2003, and I'd been in the software industry for a number of years. And uh, the database industry is a $30 billion business, and lots of companies had been in that market. And it kind of widowed down over time to it was really uh, Oracle was number one, uh, IBM, Microsoft, Sybase were all in there. But if you called anyone and said, hey, I want to go compete against Oracle, like they just hang up the phone. You say, I mean, you're out of your mind. There's no way you can do this. But there was something interesting happening. And I started to observe this because I started to see startup companies using MySQL. And of course, they used MySQL because they couldn't afford Oracle. They couldn't afford anything. It's like, but I also started seeing some customers paying for it. I thought, OK, maybe we can figure out a way to make some money out of this. But it was a little bit of a, a leap of faith. So, um, so another way to look at disruption here is there, there's sort of, uh, you know, when you're building software, you tend to add more and more features over time. And there's this blue bar that represents what it is that the customers really want. And at least in the database industry, what happened is over time, you know, you had these, the big guys, and these were all multi-billion dollar companies, hugely successful, publicly traded companies with tens of thousands of employees. And they built uh, just a huge franchise selling database software. And so we thought, well, well, we'll take these guys on. And the way we'll do this is, you know, we've got a small set of features. Um, and initially, MySQL was seen as a toy. But we're going to move up over time. And the incumbents, the big guys, they're probably going to end up building more and more capabilities into the product that a lot of people aren't going to care about. Because when you're trying to sell software licenses the way those guys did, like you've got to justify an upgrade every few years. You know, I'm sure you lived through all this. How do you generate the next version? Add more features, and then get the people to upgrade and sell, sell more of it. And we just said, we're going to do a different approach. And we're almost like different in every single way you could imagine from a traditional enterprise software company. And you know, the key element here was we happened to be open source. And so that made the distribution and the cost much lower than anything else. And I'll talk a minute about how we actually made money. But uh, this actually became part of a movement where open source really changed the rules in enterprise software. And of course, it wasn't just MySQL. It was also you know, Oracle and, uh, excuse me, I mean, uh, Linux and PHP and Ruby on Rails and other technologies over time. So let me compare sort of the existing approach from uh, the incumbents, that's the, the big companies, versus what we were doing. So the incumbents, uh, you know, Oracle and Microsoft and those guys, software typically costs about $40,000 per CPU. So if you had like five CPU or, you know, multiple CPUs in a box, like you're, and you got multiple boxes, this starts to add up. Uh, it's very expensive uh, for people to buy. And uh, so they have a fleet of uh, uh, expensive sales guys who go out and sell it. And they wear Armani suits. And they drive Ferrari cars. And they make great commissions. Larry Ellison gets a big yacht. And it's like, somebody's paying for that. You are the customer. right? It's a very expensive way to do business. But Oracle and these products get deployed on mission critical applications. So if you're running like a stock exchange or a credit card processing system or whatever, and you just absolutely can't have it fail, like you're probably going to go with Oracle or DB2. These are great products. They have a lot of complexity to them. They require a lot of training. If you're a database administrator, uh, there's a lot of stuff that can go wrong. You take courses, you learn it. Uh, it's very complicated. And they typically focused on the highest end of the market. So back in this period, people used to run a lot of benchmarks. And it's like the TPC, or Transaction Processing Council benchmarks. And you just try to show how your database was the fastest. And uh, we were talking earlier, Sybase had a great reputation on Wall Street because it was just a rock solid, screaming fast database. And if it cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars to deploy it, you know, that's, what, that's the price you paid. And typically, they're running on very expensive you know, Sun hardware, uh, HP hardware, IBM hardware, et cetera. So our approach at MySQL was just like completely the complete opposite. It's, like, it's almost like you took the. Uh, uh, you know, just tried to do everything differently in, in a very strange, bizarro planet <laughs> kind of fashion. 
So first of all, MySQL was free open source software, which means you could download the source code, you could download binaries, and you didn't actually have to pay anything for it, which is a challenge, because like, how do you make money, right? Um, as a result though, and partly because of the evolution of the internet, like, adoption became very easy. You know, people could just download it and start using it. And instead of focusing on the high-end part of the market, we focused on a part of the market that at that time nobody cared about. In 2003, people weren't really thinking a lot about web development. Uh, it sounds bizarre, but like that just wasn't where the world was at in it from a tech perspective. So we focused on those types of applications. Uh, MySQL didn't have a lot of features. It, you know, if you, if you ran a feature list of Oracle versus MySQL, like, you know, they'd have 10 times as many features as we had. And the Oracle guys would brag about that and say, look how many features we have. And we'd say, look how many features we don't have. Your life is going to be so much easier because there's less complexity. And for a certain audience, that actually made sense. Um, we were a very small footprint, you know, ran in a small amount of memory. Uh, and MySQL was really good for uh, t like a read intensive applications. So and, yeah, yep. This? This is, I mean, MySQL started in about uh, 99, 98, and I joined in 2003. So it was chugging along, but when I joined, it was about 60 employees in the company. Um, and we're generating a little bit of revenue, uh, but not a whole lot. Um, and we ran very well on commodity Intel kind of x86 hardware. But we purposely said, you know what? We are not trying to go head to head against the big guys. We're serving a different market. We're only targeting web developers. And so if you were an old school, kind of traditional guy looking at a database, you'd look at MySQL, you'd turn up your nose and say, that doesn't make sense. Why would I give up those features? But if you were a web developer and you'd never used a database before and you couldn't afford $40,000, like I need a database, what should I get? And people would just say, well, go download MySQL, it's free. So suddenly we had tens of thousands of people using MySQL. And it just grew virally, it got distributed with Linux. And suddenly, you know, it was like tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of users. Now, we were actually able to charge money for commercial licenses in some areas, but I'm not really going to go into the, the detail. But it w there was a way to make money off it. Uh, so how do we do? Well. We, we kept growing. You know, we're growing at 100% year over year. Every year we double in size. And we got to the point where there were 50,000 people downloading MySQL every day. And we tell people that number and they say like, you mean per month, per year? No, every day, 50,000. Okay, maybe some guys, you know, downloaded it twice one day, you know. Uh, but it's like a lot of people are using it. And books were written and conferences were launched and magazine articles were written. And it just became the default way to do databases on the web. So uh, all kinds of big companies started using it for their web applications. So Yahoo, Google, YouTube, Twitter, Craigslist, Facebook, blah, 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 blah. I mean, uh, out of the top 500 websites, basically about 450 or 460 or 470 of them were using MySQL. And the ones that weren't were sites that were owned by Microsoft or Oracle or others. And even our track, and again, we were a small company, but we were growing, we're maybe now 100, 150 people. And uh, we made the cover of Sports Illustrated magazine. Uh, sorry, Linux magazine. That was pretty cool. Um, and then we tracked our page views, and we noticed our page views, like the m number of people who were visiting MySQL was more than Oracle. It's like, wow, how'd that happen? And just sort of this viral adoption, because we weren't trying to be Oracle. We had tremendous respect for Oracle's technology, but the key thing is we weren't trying to be like them. Now a lot of people uh, would come to us with Oracle and say, hey, I want to migrate. And we just said, you know, it doesn't make sense to try to migrate somebody off a database. Our approach was really about um, coexistence. And if somebody had Oracle, in theory you can migrate, but it's really a hard thing. It's kind of like if you've written a program in you know, C++ and you want to translate it to Java, you could have a machine translator translate 95% of it. And then like, great, there's 5% that's going to take me another 95% of the effort to translate it. It's like, it just doesn't really work that well. So we didn't really do that. But we saw lots of pockets of Oracle users or Microsoft users who used Oracle over here. And they'd start using MySQL for web applications. And that web infrastructure started to become really popular. 
So how did the big guys react? And this is where it got uh, kind of uh, interesting. When I joined the company, I hoped to heck I could have like one year under their radar, where they, they just not pay attention to us. And I actually, we got two years under the radar, which was like just fantastic, because we could get viral adoption and really get things happening. And at the time, you know, uh, Bill Gates and Steve Ballmer at Microsoft called open source a cancer on capitalism and said this is, this is like communism and nobody should subject, this, should subject themselves to this kind of approach. And Oracle said we were, they said, you know, the president of Oracle said that they were the 747 and we were a Toyota. We're like, yeah, we're happy to be Toyota. Toyota is a hell of a company. But you've got to understand if you're in the car business or in the airplane business, right? And over time, you know, the, the big guys, IBM and Microsoft and Oracle, tried to launch what they called Express Editions, which were free versions. But they were free, but they didn't have all the features. So they'd say, okay, it's free, but you can only access up to so much amount of memory or so many gigs of data. And it's like, well, if I want to have something, I want to use a database, I don't want to limit how much data I can put in there. So the, the Express editions didn't really work, but it was their way of trying to combat us. But of course, Oracle was making all its money selling licenses at $40,000. So they could not open source their software, right? Because if they did, it'd be like, well, we can do that, but we have to lay off 95% of our employees. I mean, it's just, and our revenues will fall by like 95%. It just doesn't work for those guys. So we were pretty happy with that. And then I remember this day, October 25th, 2005, it was a Friday. I was in Cupertino and we had a board meeting that day. Uh, the board meeting was in Europe and I happened to not be at the meeting. Uh, so we were busy with some other stuff. And we actually had open, so MySQL has a multiple different storage engines. And we had one engine that's built in. It's a configuration option called InnoDB. And it lets you do transactions like commit and roll back and other stuff. And because we're open source, this was written by a different open source team in Helsinki, three guys. And um, half our customers used that storage engine. And uh, we were trying to acquire those guys for like nine months because we wanted that technology. So it's like if we're Ford and we have an engine, the engine's made by somebody else, and we want, we want to own that engine because that's part of our whole thing. And we're, you know, a lot of our customers are dependent on that. So I happened to call back to my boss and they just finished the board meeting and said, yeah, the board gave us full approval so that we can go ahead and you know, uh, buy these guys in Obase uh, for stock and we'll try to negotiate with them and we'll work out a deal. Great, fantastic. And you know, it's eight hours, nine hours later in Europe and then it's uh, getting close to one o'clock. I haven't had lunch and I was really thinking about going out for falafel with the guys because I was just really hungry. And then this uh, press release crosses the wire. And it's from Oracle. Oracle acquires an ODB. And it's like, oh, shoot. You know, what the, so this is like our core technology. And it's just been acquired by our arch nemesis. <laughs> you know, they now own a key piece of our technology. And, you know, we have like 250 employees at this point. And it's like, uh, what does this mean? And I remember I was, I kind of, in my office and I kicked a trash can across the room and it's like, holy shit, what do we do now? Well, I guess we're not going out for lunch. <laughs> um, we've got a couple of hours and we've got to put together a strategy and figure out how to communicate that to all our employees. Oh, and by the way, I forgot to mention this, you know, we're in California and there's like 12 of us there or six or 10 or whatever. Um, but the other 250 employees, they all work in different cities around the world. Like we're in 40 different countries. Because we just hired the best developers wherever we could hire them. They, we weren't all in one building. But suddenly now on email and IRC and chat, everyone's like, hey, did you see this announcement from Oracle? What does this mean to us? Like, wh what do we tell our customers? What do, we tell, what do I tell my wife, my, my family? Like, are we in business anymore? <laughs> what does this mean? So uh, we had to hunker down uh, pretty seriously. So it was... Uh, this was like the toughest time in, in this business, and it was really like man the battle stations. And I remember I was on the phone to uh, one of the guys who worked for me. He was in Denver, and I uh, had Martin, the CEO, on Skype chat from London, and they just finished this dinner, and they're like, oh my God, I can't believe what just happened. 
and uh, we got to issue a press, we got a couple hours, and then we got to issue a press release saying what the hell is our response. And it's kind of a time where everybody's looking around, it's like, uh, okay, how are we going to respond? And it's like, and there's like, okay, let me go figure this out. And I started working on the press release and how we're going to communicate this. And um, we, uh, by the end of the day, we first took care of all our employees because everybody's in a bit of a panic, right? And if you're in a panic situation, you're in battle, it's like you got to provide leadership. You got to tell people it's going to be okay. And you have to have an idea of how it's going to be okay. Because they're like, well, what just happened? How are we going to respond? So we formulated all that in a couple of hours and wrote a press release and we announced MySQL now has a new pluggable open storage engine <laughs> system. And we kind of had these technical underpinnings, but it's like, how are we going to counter this? It's like, well, we're open source, so let's not forget that. And even though Oracle owns this technology, well, we actually have a contract with the, the people who wrote it, and we have the rights to distribute it for two years. Or, or they were expiring in a couple months, but potentially. And it's open source anyways. So even though Oracle owns the IP, the code is out there, and everyone has free access to it. So we had to formulate all this stuff and communicate it and figure it out. Uh, but we immediately had to start work on plan B. So we announced this pluggable storage engine architecture. And we said, and I know it's hard to read this, but there's multiple different engines, InnoDB and MyISAM and Cluster and a whole bunch of others. And it was maybe uh, a little bit of architecture and a little bit of architecture, meaning uh, you know, we think of it as pluggable, but uh, if you've ever seen the back of an old uh, set of tubes or something or wires you know in a routing system it's pluggable like there's 500 cables back there it's not necessarily easy to do but conceptually it makes sense and then we said well we better start working on plan b like this other storage engine that we had in development called uh, maria and then i find out from the vp of engineering that well you know i said so what progress has been done on this maria thing we've talked about with the founders he said well we uh, picked the code name and like no code had been written yet. And it's like, okay, well, I guess uh, we better get cranking on that. And then we worked on a strategy of plan B and plan C and plan D. And we had like these multiple paths because um, it's, it's like if we didn't figure this out, we were really going to be out of business. Like, and we didn't know what was going to happen. And every customer is like, well, is, is MySQL still going to be around? Or does Oracle now have it? Is Oracle going to own this? Is Oracle going to just totally mess with these guys and shut it down? Or what would happen? So we also began the process of negotiating with Oracle for, uh, to renew the contract. And uh, we went out and we raised money. And MySQL revenues were, 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 you know, were probably around uh, 40 or 50 million on an annual basis. Uh, it slowed us down a little bit, but it was kind of like in this darkest moment, it would have been very easy to just say, wow, this is not gonna end well, I'm out of here. But we all believed in the power of disruption. And we all believed that you know, Oracle has the rights to do this stuff, but we actually have certain rights because of the open source nature of our software. And we kind of evolved our business a little bit so that if Oracle shut down that project, we would be okay. We would still have uh, some new things and we'd create a new storage engine. Uh, but it was uh, kind of a high stakes uh, game. So what happened? Well, the storage engine strategy actually worked. And we talked with, I think we must have talked with 10 different teams uh, in, from different companies. Uh, IBM wanted to build a storage engine for us. It's like, great. They became a partner of ours working on a storage engine. We talked to Sybase. We couldn't get the Sybase guys to move, but uh, we had two or three other storage engines under the works. We hired a small company. We had our Maria project that we felt like, okay, now we'll staff that with a little bit more urgency. Um, and then we actually were able to renew our contract with Oracle. And they extended the terms of this agreement with us for another two years. And we don't really know why they did that. <laughs> we sort of speculate. And it was because there was this power in the open source community. And it was not from us as employees of MySQL. It was from the fact that there were millions of users of MySQL technology out there. And Oracle just did not want to mess with the open source community. So um, what, what it made me realize was that in this disruption that we were doing, MySQL, the movement, MySQL, the open source thing, was bigger than us, little MySQL as a company. But it was also bigger than Oracle, which was just staggering. It's like, how could we 
get those guys over this time to back down. And, and you know, I think they wanted to acquire us, but they couldn't quite figure out how to do so. And we'd have these lengthy discussions and it was I just, the, 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 you know, the origins of the company were f Swedish and Finnish. And Martin Mikos, who was my boss, the CEO, uh, he was a Finnish gentleman. And they'd lived under the threat of Russia for many decades. And it was kind of like just staring down the, the communists and saying how we want to remain independent and that was really a good thing and you know we'll think about these other ideas because Oracle kept trying to make us into say well why don't you make this stuff proprietary and we'll license it to you in this way and we'd ham and haw and we say we think that's a good idea but really don't you think that's going to upset the Linux community and because Oracle cared a lot about the Linux community and then they we, we just never ended up backing down we chose to stay on the path of being open source and being disruptive, even though it meant we might potentially just like go out of business. But we felt that if we became, if we tried to be like Oracle, and we tried to be part open source and part closed source and part proprietary, like then we can't really compete anymore. So we really had this tremendous con conviction around it. And then we kept growing, and we got ready for uh, an IPO, and we actually got to about, uh, uh, 100 million in, in revenue. So we slowed down a little bit our growth by a quarter or two, but then it kind of got back on track as we launched these storage engines. And Oracle renewed the contract and actually kept working on NODB. And this, you know, even though they, they said, hey, we're not trying to slow you down, it was actually genuine. And I think they just couldn't quite figure out open source, but they want to study it and understand it. Um, but they weren't trying to kill us, uh, which was, uh, <laughs> we were grateful for that. And we eventually sold the company to Sun for a billion dollars uh, back in, in 2008. And we're just looking at the market at that point where it's like, you know, we could do an IPO, but it, it, it just seemed like some customers in the financial sector were, were not spending as much as they used to. And for those who lived through this, it's like there's a tr collapse in the financial economy. So I'm glad we didn't do an IPO. And then ironically, like two years later, Sun acquired uh, Oracle, uh, excuse me, uh, Oracle acquired Sun for seven billion dollars and you know we kind of became part of Oracle, the guys who seemed like they were trying to kill us. So what was going on with that? So this is me at a conference, uh, the MySQL conference a few years back and this was uh, the guy that we did all our negotiations with from Oracle, a guy named Ken Jacobs who was like employee number 25 at Oracle and been there forever. and. Um, we were trying to figure out how to, you know, handle this situation. So one year at our conference, we said, you know what? We give these awards for best developer and best use of MySQL. We gave Oracle an award as our best supplier. And we didn't tell him in advance, but we just announced it on stage. And he had to go up on stage and accept the award. And he was just completely embarrassed by it. But like, what are you going to do if you get an award? You pretty much have to accept it. Um, and I think in the end, they, they really did want MySQL. So they weren't, you know, they came after us actually in, in 2007 and they came and said, well, we, we, we really want to acquire you guys for 300 million. And, and, then they, and then we just say, no, we don't want to be a part of that. And they tried to acquire us for 400 and 500 and 600 and 700. And we just kept saying no. And then eventually we thought, you know, we may have to do this. But then Sun came in and we, we, we got an even higher price. But it was even, even up till the 11th hour as the deal was about to be consummated with, with Sun, Oracle was still trying to come in and, and acquire us. And even after we were part of Sun, Oracle went back to Sun to try to buy it out of Sun. And the reason was, it's hard for the big guys to innovate in a disruptive fashion, right? Oracle's good at doing the next version of Oracle, the next version, the next version, the next version. They're not good about saying, how do we change the rules of the game? And so this is a, a, an outcome that happens once in a while where a big company will buy a small company in order to be disruptive. And it's actually, it's a, it's a good way, it's a, it's a, a natural outcome uh, and it, it kind of enabled Oracle then to go compete more broadly against SQL Server uh, in the Windows market. Um, so that was, uh, that's my little experience there with, with MySQL. So, uh, there's a couple things to keep in mind if, you're, if, you're, if you end up in this uh, disruptive strategy. And the key thing is you can't play the incumbent's game. You can't compete on their turf. If they have a certain way of competing or how they acquire customers, you have to think, how can you do it differently? Because you're never going to out Oracle, Oracle, or out Microsoft, Microsoft, et cetera. 
You gotta be very careful uh, in a smaller company not to go after the most lucrative, expensive customers because it's gonna just get you into a whole world of one-off business. Uh, you really wanna look for volume. You also have to be careful of, if you build a product and you say, well, this is gonna be great, but it requires people to behave differently, people to buy differently or operate differently, that might be a warning sign. Uh, be very careful of, you know, when you, particularly when you see companies that are pursuing market share or growth ahead of profits, and you say, well, you know, we're gonna lose money, but we're gonna make it up in volume. Like, that doesn't always work out very well. It's better to have a rational business model. And if you're in a large company, the key thing to look for, or, you know, is don't try to make the disruptive ideas don't slow down the disruption with the old school or big bureaucratic ways of operating. And if you look at companies today that used to be disruptive, like uh, RIM, does anyone work at RIM? Okay, so it's not, I don't mean, that, RIM is, was a phenomenally disruptive company in the early days. Now, not so much, right? And, and the challenge, I'm sure there's teams inside of RIM who are ready to be disruptive and do things differently, but they probably get saddled with kind of this old school approach of bureaucratic, et cetera, which doesn't always work well. Any questions on, yep? Yeah, so um, can you um, elaborate more on the third point? I'm not sure if I understand because if a lot of quality can come to the game, then I'm Yeah, so I, yeah, it, it's a subtle point, but it means, um, you want to look for evidence that behavior is changing, but not that it's dependent on you changing their behavior. So if, like if you, and th this is the great thing, that if you, like what we observed is startups are using MySQL because they just download it and they make stuff happen. But we didn't have to convince people to do that, they were just doing it already. So it's sort of like you want to see that change in behavior, but it can't be based on, um, I, I, I'm not sure. Greg, can you give me an analogy here? This is my wife, Greg. Say hi. Um, so it's like if you say, well, we're going to launch this new chain of restaurants and it's going to be totally optimal because uh, we're going to serve people lunch at uh, 2 p.m. Oh, actually, there was a restaurant in Santa Cruz. This is like the most bizarre thing. It was all cereal. Okay, now I eat cereal. I like cereal. I eat cereal for breakfast. And it's a college town. It's like Waterloo. So, you know, students eat you know, cereal all day, right? Well, no, they don't. <laughs> Nobody wants a restaurant where all you can get is cereal. I mean, it's like the dumbest friggin' idea I've ever heard. <laughs> but it, it was based on this extrapolation that says, well, you know, people love cereal, so we're gonna serve it at lunch and dinner and after hours. And it's like, you're saying, well, people are gonna change their behavior in a way that doesn't, doesn't really extrapolate and it makes sense. It's not the best analogy, but other questions? Yep. How you made money. Okay, so let me explain how, how we made money. So in open source, uh, th there's two things we did. One, we had a GPL license. Anyone familiar with how the GPL works? GPL is a reciprocal open source license. And what it means is uh, the software is free if, uh, if you, uh, I should say, you have to abide by the principles of the GPL. And the GPL says if you distribute your software with GPL software, your software also has to be open sourced. It's a yeah, it's a strong version versus a permissive license like Apache says you do whatever you want. So what that meant was companies would download MySQL, they start using it, but if they were gonna distribute uh, MySQL with their appliance or software package, et cetera, they had to open source their software. And they say, well, no, we love that you're open source. There's no way we're open sourcing our stuff. <laughs> like, are you out of your mind? We'd lose money. <laughs> and so then we'd sell them a commercial license. And that was the initial bootstrapping of the company. And I like to think that this was the, the brilliance of the founders and they figured out how the GPL worked. And it was really just a lucky accident. It's just how RMS, uh, Richard Stallman, built the GPL to promote open source. We had this notion of quid pro quo. We said, look, if you're open source, you can distribute MySQL free of charge, no problem but otherwise we'll sell you a commercial license. Now again, this is back in 2003. This is before there were a lot of uh, cloud-based companies or internet companies. So Google or Yahoo technically did not have to pay us because they weren't distributing their software. Their software just runs up on servers, et cetera. 
Uh, sometimes we'd sell them things. And then we built this other software. This is the part that I built was uh, monitoring software for uh, seeing the performance of, of your MySQL system, managing system uptime, downtime, having a rules-based engine that would help you monitor the system. So if you're managing two servers, it's pretty easy. DBA can manage that. You got five, six servers and they're mission critical. Okay, it's getting a little more complicated. You have more than 10 servers, like it's hard because you don't know what's going to go wrong when, et cetera. And so we built all this monitoring software. And we said the database is free, but if you want the monitoring stuff, well, we sell that. And when we go out to uh, small companies, they say, well, we'll just do our own monitoring. That's, thank you, we're not going to pay for anything. But larger companies would say, well, you got this monitoring stuff? That looks pretty cool. We'll pay for that. And again, our goal was always to be 90% cheaper than Oracle or Sybase or DB2 or any others. And so it was the, we had a subscription revenue model on the monitoring software, and that's the piece that, that ultimately grew to 100 million. Is that a question yeah, Josh? Uh, would uh, MySQL still have words if it was free but closed source? How, how do you contrast that free? Yeah, and that was a big debate. Would, would MySQL have worked if it was free uh, but open source? And there's many, many people who did not care that MySQL was open source, but they cared that it was free. But there were some benefits that we got from it being uh, open source. One is sometimes people would port MySQL to a different platform. Like we'd have a customer call us up and say, hey, we, we want to buy MySQL commercially on uh, some old platform, SGI IREX. And we say, well, we don't have a version for that. So that's okay, we ported it for you and we'll give it to you. And you know, there's some compiler directives they had to do and change some stuff and here's all the patches. And so the fact that it was open source enabled a certain amount of adoption to happen, uh, particularly in the hacker community. Uh, I don't know that it, it, it matters, so, like in the early days it mattered a lot that it was open source. That's how we got distribution with Linux and other uh, distros. Over time, I'm not sure that mattered so much. Uh, and the notion of free software has been around for a long time. But the other thing we couldn't have done is the uh, original licensing w for, G for commercial vendors, that worked because it was GPL licensed. And if it was free, that would have been harder. So it's kind of hard to answer in theory. And, and I love open source. It was a phenomenal business. Zendesk, we're not open source. Because <laughs> open source is a very hard business model. And the reason it worked for us you know, 99% of the people did not pay us, or 98, 99, but the, it was a very high volume business and that's why it worked. And so you have to be careful if you use open source. If you're not in a high volume business, uh, you may not ever make money. Yep. What is that non-contradictory, don't lose money, make it up in volume? Well, MySQL was profitable, even in the early days. So meaning we had a, if you thought of it as a system, it was a system that used different parameters and different pieces were uh, made money for us, but we weren't in the business of losing money. So it wasn't like we said, we're gonna go acquire customers for uh, hundreds or thousands of dollars, but they don't pay us. I mean, they came to us and they got the distributions themselves and then some number self-selected. So it, it's versus um, sometimes you'll see businesses where you just think like, like it may not be sustainable if, you, if you're just losing money. And, and a lot of dot-com companies in you know, 99 and 2000 were like pets.com and they're shipping dog food and it costs them more to ship it than they're charging for it. How does that work? Well, it, it doesn't work. I'm going to share uh, one, one last uh, slide. And these are some thoughts, and bear with me because we're going to run over time. I thought in retrospect, and it's not a convocation speech, but I thought I'd share some observations or things that I, I felt I'd learned in 30 years. And these are very serious. That's why I put my serious photo for this one. Um, one thing I think is just really important if, if you're uh, you know, an undergrad or a young person is like, find the thing that you're really passionate about. Like, I love the computer industry. I just lived it, I loved it, I still love it. I get excited every day. I read TechCrunch, you know, it's just like, I love what's going on there. Maybe it's something different for you. But find the thing that you're really passionate about. Because if you focus on that, like MySQL was a hell of a lot of fun, and even if it didn't make money, we had fun, and we would have enjoyed it. We enjoyed it more because we were su successful, but find something you're passionate about. Second thing, never stop learning. Like you are always, there's always the opportunity to learn, whether it's from your, your managers or the situation you're in, the market you're in, and particularly in the computer industry, stuff changes so fast 
that this is a one area where, like if you're, if you're young and you're learning some new skill, HTML5 and Rails and stuff like that, you, if you've learned that and you have 18 months of skills on that, you may know more than some old guy like me. Because it's all new to everybody. And so just always keep learning uh, and look for opportunities to learn. Third thing, I think it's really important to work on hard things that matter. Sometimes in life you have an option to, to go in an easy direction and take an easy job or get an easy promotion and other things. It's like, you know, I think if you go the, the harder route and challenge yourself, you get more out of it. And you know, I don't know what's imp important you know, in terms of areas to focus on, but if it's something you're passionate about, then, then it'll probably be exciting for you. Sometimes you gotta buck convention. Disruption is all about bucking convention. But you have to understand that's not something you do every single day or every single company. These opportunities are fairly rare. And once in a while, you go out, you go out on a limb, and this is the fantastic thing about Silicon Valley. You go out, you try something, and if it doesn't work, it's okay. You just go start another company in the next couple of years. Uh, and you'll hopefully not make the same mistake. You'll make different mistakes, new improved mistakes. And this is one of the most powerful things I believe in, which is brute force ex execution can make up for many things. And like, you know, I'm a marathon runner on occasion. I'm not athletic, but I just kept at it. And I said, you know, I, I wanna run a marathon. And anybody here can go run a marathon. Anybody here can go uh, learn a musical instrument or develop a skill or start a software company. You just have to be persistent about it. And this is the thing, particularly small companies and startups, you can out execute big companies because you just throw a lot of, you know, a lot more at bats at it. You spend a lot more time at it and you, you can go do things that other people won't do. And it's not, it may, maybe you're super talented and have innate skills, which is fantastic. But if you don't, execution makes up for a lot of that. Like I play guitar, my wife will attest, I don't have any uh, abilities whatsoever. <laughs> But I just keep at it, and I keep at it, and I keep at it, and like five years from now, I'll be five years better, <laughs> and maybe one day I'll be okay. But I used to think it like you had to have this fundamental talent to do that stuff. And I think almost anything in life, if you just focus on it and do it and keep at it, you will succeed. Or at least you'll, you'll equal, you know, you'll have a better shot at success. Key to happiness, spend less than you make. This is really, really a key, uh, key lesson. And the last lesson, the last lesson is marry wisely. This is my wife, say hi. Uh, you do these things, you know, maybe it will be different things for you, but your life will be good if you do these things. My wife is taken, but you know, you'll find your own passion. Maybe we'll just open up for any last questions, yes? I, I was, you had thrown something out at me earlier and I was kind of stumped in the yep. but I was thinking one, one thing is like you were talking about Google was a good example of coming in against the Yahoo's and the excitement. Yeah. People you guys don't even know about, these, all these search engines that went and became these things called portals. And they had these fancy home pages and all this content and everything. And Google came out and they had this little box. Search bar, yeah. You know, and, and, but they came at it from a different way of looking at search. And everybody at first was like, yeah, well, they don't have any content on their home page. Yeah, what is this? This isn't going to amount to anything. And I think a lot of the big players just kind of ignored them. Yep. And slowly but surely, you know, they, they created a better way of searching, and that led to being able to create a foundation for a lot of other yep. stuff. But I don't think people here know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's good to be young, because you, you, yep. It's a question up here. I would be interested to know, uh, thank you for the insightful talk. Uh, yep. Oh yeah. Database. Is that a sign of disrupt disruption? Is that is that something that's going to be as big as the online CRM that Salesforce is putting out for? Quite well, it, yeah. So th there's a lot of companies all in the and I got calls from every single company that's trying to do some new database in the cloud kind of thing when I, I left MySQL. Uh, so uh, Salesforce has their own database in the cloud phenomena. I don't know if I think if you look at the criteria and say is it disruptive? I don't know that it really is. It, you know, it's cool, it's innovative. I don't know. 
I mean, the jury is out, and sometimes you, you, you know, it's hard to say whether it's really disruptive, but I don't know that people are necessarily clamoring for a, the way they do the database stuff in the cloud. Um, there's lots of different ways to, to, to tackle that problem. Uh, they may all, be, it may be more of a sustained kind of innovation or refinement. I don't know that it's really classically disruptive, meaning if you think about it in some sense, access to database technology in the cloud, that's kind of like been there, done that. It's been commoditized. It's, there are many different places that offer that kind of service from Quicken to there's lot, several other databases in the cloud. So I don't know that if, if what Salesforce is doing there matches the, the full criteria of being disruptive, meaning there's lots of companies that do that and lots of, the barrier to entry there is not high. Now, it, 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 can Oracle do that or will Oracle do that? Probably not. But I don't necessarily see signs of a massive adoption in that area. Um, and this is the thing, it's like disruption is just one strategy. There's lots of ways to skin a cat. There's lots of ways to build companies. You don't have to be disruptive to be successful. Like Facebook is not disruptive. Facebook is just awesome. It's this brand new thing. But it wasn't disrupting an existing market per se. So this is just one lens to look through. Uh, but when you do find disruption, it, it can be very powerful. Yep. We often hear about like bubbles in the tech market. I mean, like, there was one like 11 years ago. Do you, do you feel we're not pushing another bubble? Yeah, so the question is, uh, uh, there are bubbles 11 year, uh, bubble in the tech market, is there a uh, bubble now? And uh, my wife and I were talking about this at the time because in, in 99, I remember we went out for dinner with a bunch of friends in Silicon Valley, and everybody was in a hot startup. You know, there was like 10 or 12 of us. You know, one person's going off the red hat and somebody's at this one, we're at this one, this blah, blah, blah. And, and afterward, it's, a, a year later, after the bubble burst, there was another dinner, it was somebody's party, and everyone's like, yeah, I'm doing some consulting, taking some time off, I'm gonna go back to school. <laughs> it's like, if you're ever at a dinner and like everybody's gonna strike it rich, it's not gonna happen, right? I mean, it's just not everybody's above average and it's just not gonna happen. So. Uh, there was definitely a tech bubble at that time where people were valuing businesses on irrational, an irrational basis. It was not about the fundamentals of revenues and profits. And it was based on like eyeballs and how many people will use your service, even if they're losing, you're losing money. It just made, it was completely irrational. And, and, and you know, it's sort of like when you start hearing stock tips from, you know, your plumber, your mechanic, and everybody's trading stocks, it's like, it's time to get out. Like, you should have got out already. <laughs> um, I don't know that we have that same thing happening today. I think valuations are very high. Uh, some of the IPOs, uh, you know, I think there's good businesses. Facebook makes money. LinkedIn makes money. Are they valued too highly? Yeah, probably. Could the market correct a little bit? Yes. Um, but you know, it's like if they continue to grow, it's all based on forward earnings. So it's, it's very hard to predict. But I would say one of the things that's changed in this 10, 11 years is the cost of starting a business is very low. Partly because of the web and cloud, partly because of open source software, partly because of commoditization of cost of CPUs and stuff like that. So there, there, way more companies get started now than maybe is healthy. So you take one idea like uh, database.com and the cloud and stuff, like there's 20 companies that do exactly that. You know, social network for, you know, guys who used to own Apple IIs. There's probably three companies around that. So there's more influx of capital, and, and that's not necessarily a good sign. It means many companies will compete in a space, it will become more crowded, and it becomes hard to stand out. So what do the VCs do? Pour in the money, and like everybody makes these bets, it's like the, there's a social network that went public, what's our bet on social networks? SaaS companies doing great, how do we back three more SaaS companies? And it just becomes a little bit crowded, but I don't know that that necessarily is, is a bubble in the sense of like, will we have a crash in the economy or something like that? But it's hard to say. <clears throat> Is anyone tw Twittering or live blogging? I wore a pink tie today in honor, so. Okay. I wore pink ties too. Yeah. Great. I, uh, I'd like to ask everyone to join me in thanking Zach for a fantastic presentation.